welcome to another live stream. This is uh, an impromptu one, and I haven't turned on my microphone. There we go. Oh, almost. I got too excited, and I just started streaming without having my microphone even on or turned on. So, uh, and that's because this is all about relaxed sound, and so I was too relaxed. It's almost as if I planned it. All right, so now we should be in business. Uh, if I can get this on my, on my pants there. Okay, so uh, how do you produce a relaxed sound? This is a topic that we hear about Sometimes we uh, maybe work, at, work on it with a teacher or uh, we read about it in a book and it's like, okay, what, what is that exactly? Well, we're really talking about the, both the quality of the sound, in other words, we don't want it to be a tight sound, uh, over, uh, too many high overtones or too muted in any way, right? We want it to just be this, this expansive, big, beautiful sound that also feels uh, somewhat effortless to produce, that we're just blowing and the buzz is happening on its own and it's just kind of relaxed, right? And so that's, I'm here in my t-shirt and we're just talking about how to produce that. And then maybe how that's just the beginning of the process. Yesterday I talked a ton about being having a really good firm embouchure and keeping it firm as you play difficult things. And that's true. But if you started with that, you might end up with a really tight sound and not a lot of facility. So I thought I should follow it up today with uh, a, a relaxed sound kind of building warm up. And so that's what we're going to do. I haven't played a note yet today. It's already 7 o'clock p.m. Oh, my gosh. And uh, but I'm going to play with you now. And uh, if you're if you're here, I did I, I did actually bring up the chat. So if you have questions about anything, please feel free to ask. And um, yeah, we're just gonna go ahead and get started with our relaxed sound warm up. So again, if this is for you, if you have a tight sound, if you have difficulty with tone production or just producing pitches in the first place, um, if you have difficulty moving around the horn, I think this would be a good place to start. Uh, this is a good place to start for most people. And that's why, uh, I'm, that's why I'm doing it, especially, like I said, in opposition to what I did yesterday, which was kind of the opposite but they're, they're, you need both, right, eventually. And so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to use some gadgets today. I'm not, I don't sponsor, uh, I'm not sponsored by anyone except for Yamaha. And, uh, and for the, I just play their instruments. Uh, we have a really easy clinicianship. Uh, but the other gadgets I'm going to use are the Stomp V Up Sound, which is a really great device uh, for getting your buzz really active. And, um, and we're also going to use the Wind O, which is a good device to get your corners associated with the blow. And so, but first we're just gonna buzz, free buzz, in fact, right? So the first thing we're gonna do is just try to make, just try to exhale really easily, and then we're gonna put that into a very low buzz, right? So just kind of, again, lazy, right? Just relaxed. And we want, the, we want to notice the quality of the air flow, right? I don't want right now, right? I don't want that at all. I just want as if it's falling out of me. That's one, one way that uh, pedagogues often will describe this is just let the air fall out, right? So I want to notice the quality of that. And now I want a little more control. So I'm going to go. I can still call this a very relaxed airflow, right? In other words, it's not encountering a lot of resistance. It's just kind of flowing freely, right? So now we want, we want to put that on our lips. We, want our, or we need a buzz to happen. We want it to happen easily. So I just start with a nice, easy, what I call a horse buzz, right? We did horse whinny yesterday. Today we're doing the horse buzz. It's a good way to get blood flow to your lips anyway. If you do it too much, you can get a lot of swelling, so don't do this a lot. But I want that same, I feel like the sides of my air, I feel like my air is about this big, right? It's like a, it's, it's a, it's just kind of right here in this width, right? That's the same size. Now there's just a buzz with it. And you might notice I'm going, 
I'm starting with my lips together, but they're just flapping out of the way very easily, right? So we want to keep this going, and we're just going to, we're going to raise the pitch just a little bit on it, but we don't want more restriction. So if you start feeling like you're getting restricted, go back, go back the other way, right? Make sure that it stays that relaxed feeling. Right? Just a little bit of free buzzing, and we want to emulate that when we actually play the other instrument, or the, the, the mouthpiece, the trumpet, any of the gadgets, okay? So, now we're going to get the first gadget, which is the wind O. Looks like this. It's a little sort of a, I don't know, looks like a little plane or a boat or something. And what you do is you put your corners on the sides there, and when you push in, it allows that hole to open. Without it, it's closed, right? See if I can get that to open on camera. I can't quite get the angle, but you get the idea, right? Without it, I can't blow through it with it. it the air flows freely, right? I have the medium bands on this one, and both of them. Uh, you need, you, if, you, if you do this, you can change the bands on the inside of them here. And, uh, oops, and I try to get it in your, yeah, you can sort of see the rubber bands on there. Um, not quite as nice as I'd like, but yeah. Um, you need both bands, otherwise it goes out of alignment and it gets stuck on itself. So make sure you always use both bands. I also go through bands really quickly because I've had mine for a long time. And so the rubber bands are getting a little bit old. And uh, that's probably just because I, I didn't keep them in the dark place or whatever. But all right, so what are we doing with this? Well, we want to start to attach some embouchure. But uh, and I, the free buzzing that we just did, the horse buzzing, and the sort of you know medium horse buzzing, uh, that's not really what it's going to feel like, but we just want to get some association with the airflow and the buzz, right? That somehow the, the, the buzz doesn't impede the airflow, and we want to convince ourselves of that physically so that when we actually play the trumpet, uh, which we're going to do, we're, we're going to do differently than I normally do, right? This is, like, like I said, this is kind of um, a, uh, the, the precursor to a lot of the stuff that I normally teach, and, um, and so that's why it's important, but it's also, uh, it's not really what I focus on anymore. Uh, and, and so if this is already just old news to you, and if you don't have any trouble, you know, playing the trumpet, then you don't need to necessarily uh, work on this right now. But I, I realize it's, it's a big hole missing in my uh, sort of pedagogical system, and, you know, that's why we're addressing it. So we're basically going to just blow air all day today, and the buzz is going to happen because of that airflow and not because we made it happen, right? So I'm not, I don't ever want to feel like I'm going, right? That way there's a buzz, but it's, it's not really restrictive. It's not, it's not impeding my airflow at all. And that's, so that we're not going to buzz on this at all. We're just going to get the embouchure, the corners, right? So the, the medium bands, it's pretty intense. Uh, I would start with the softest bands, which I think regular bands come on it, but you can go to extra soft. Um, but just a little bit of that goes a long way. It's really strong corners and completely free airflow. And that's what we're after. All right, so there's, there's one gadget. Now we're just going to buzz the mouthpiece next. This is my normal mouthpiece, my straight eight that I always play. Right, and we're we're there's a, I don't have a, pin, a pinwheel, but there's a pedagogical style that is that you want to always make like if you had a pinwheel that was this far this far in front of you, right? That you would try to make that pinwheel go round and round with your air, right? And that you want a really airy buzz. Now I don't subscribe to this for myself anymore, but I'm gonna I'll tie it all together for you because they're they're bo we're both right, right? That everybody's right. That's my that's my pedagogical philosophy is that everybody's right and we have to figure out how they're right and if we don't have it figured out it, we may just not be ready for that information in our own journey yet or maybe we're way past it those are all totally valid choices but anybody who's trying to help people and who has experience uh actually playing well they're probably right 
they're not, they're certainly not going to lie to us, right? So anyway, like I said, I, I don't do the pinwheel uh, airy buzz, but we're going to do an airy buzz today and I'll show you why and how to, how to, how to bridge the gap between that and a really nasally, what I call angry bees buzz. Okay. So first, same thing. We want this unimpeded airflow. So we're just going to do that through the mouthpiece. All right. And we're going to keep this relaxed. This is really important. We're not going to have everything is just going to be totally just nothing. All right. Just completely relaxed as much as possible, except for those corners that we just worked on, right? If we wanted to, we can tie, the, tie these things together a little bit closer, and I can use the up, uh, the, the uh, wind O, that's the wind, wind, wind W-I-N-D dash O, wind O. You can see my corners are good, but everything else is, is, is flabby except for what is made by the corners, so. completely unimpeded. In fact, if I just blow with no shape, and this is what's important about this, if I, if I, right, I'm not even matching the, my embouchure into the, into the mouthpiece at all, I get resistance out of the length of pipe, right, the length of tube. You can feel that, right? There's, there's a blowback there. And I'm, I don't, I'm not looking for that. That means I, I need to shape my mouth in such a way that even though this part's relaxed, maybe it's my tongue position, maybe it's my jaw height, right? Maybe it's just those corners, but I wanna match the mouthpiece so that it just fits the mouthpiece perfectly and I don't feel any resistance to the air at all. And I should feel a ton of airflow on this side of the mouthpiece, right? So. But just those corners from the window, and you can just make corners too, right? You don't have to have the device. Right? Now I'm blowing pretty hard. We're not going to be able to blow that hard when we buzz, but we just want to sort of sneak our lips little by little closer and closer together. And I even, ultimately, I want to get to that same poo attack right? But with an unimpeded, so that means more relaxed here, right? So if I start with them together, I want it to feel just like that. That's why we started there, right? So maybe we can try for that now, right? feel air as if it could move uh, one of those paper pinwheels, right? And if you have one, you should just get one and it, you want it about six inches to a foot away. And the further, the better, right? That's what this is about. And so it, it's essentially that the airflow is more important, right? And that the buzz is happening sort of incidentally on the edges of the airflow, if that makes sense. So I'm focused more on the airflow being unimpeded, right? And I still want to buzz. And I'm, like I said, I'm just sneaking my lips closer and closer together, putting a little more in the mouthpiece, but I'm letting them blow open as soon as, I, as soon as the air passes them. They're just, and then they just accidentally get excited by that motion, right? air in my buzz. I don't know if it translates to the to the internet very well, but you can you can hear that sound of we call that blow by normally, right? It's the the air is going by and it's not making a buzz. And in this case it's a good thing. Normally I don't like blow by, but uh, and again, I'm, I will bridge that gap almost uh, almost next. Right? That's the sound. Just, uh, I, I want the air to flow unimpeded, right? And it takes a lot of support from down here to do that, <sighs> right? If you're not feeling that support activate, then uh, you're probably not blowing enough air or hard enough 
uh, for this all to work. You don't want to just let it fall out from up here, but now we're blowing it out and we're keeping it unimpeded, right? We started with, oh, but now we, as soon as we start blowing air, we should start to feel this core activate. All right, so now this device, this is, uh, this is part of the Stom V up sound. I don't like the bottom part because it's just, I don't need the grip. Uh, and uh, well, and frankly, it, it looks a little bit um, X-rated. Uh, so it's hard to carry around in your trumpet case. And so I just leave it off. I don't even know where mine is. It's somewhere, but, but I just need this part. I just need this little assembly, right? And what this does is it adds a little resistance. And so it will magnify whether or not I'm getting a lot of blow by, or if I'm actually getting a, a really bright sort of, like I said, angry bees kind of buzz. And what I want to do for me on the Stom V, I want to start with the blow by, and then I want to slowly get my tongue position in the right spot to make it angry bees where there's almost no air blow by. But in this case, we're going to stick with the blow by. We're going to stick with the airy buzz, right? Like we're making a pinwheel move. And now we've got a little bit of resistance on here. All right. I keep, I keep getting too close. I moved my camera. You'll notice as I come down, I lose a little bit of the airiness. And for me, that's what I'm looking for uh, the way that I play now. Uh, if, you're, if you're working on your production, you might want to just stick with the airy buzz, and you'll see why in a minute. This is not going to be a long warm-up, by the way. We're just going to get to the horn pretty quickly, and then we'll keep going. Yeah, hear all that blow by? Now you should really feel this core, you should feel your diaphragm and your abdominal muscles really working to keep that air against this resistance without it feeling tight, right? That's what we're looking for. We don't want to feel tightness. We want to feel release of air. So that's the critical part of this type of warm up, right? We want the air to feel like it's releasing the same on every note, on every volume, no matter what we're playing, no matter what, no matter what, okay? So another tool that helps do that. Right? And like I said, I use this a different way. I, I start with the blow by and then I try to make it brighter and brighter, but um, we're not going to do that. I, like I said, this is, the, this is the beginning. And then if I make it brighter, I'm just going to play more efficiently. But if I make it tighter instead of, and brighter or instead of brighter, that's not more efficient. Right? So we're starting with just the airflow and we're going to stick with that for this warm up. I know I said I'd bridge it. That's the bridge is I'm not going to show you that right now, maybe in a different video. Um, Lots of my videos have all of this stuff in it, so all the warm-up stuff. So you can find that somewhere else. But but just if you start with that and then you want to brighten it up, as long as the airflow remains constant, you're you're going to play only more efficiently, right? So there's the there's that. All right. So now we want a trumpet. It doesn't matter which one. Uh, since most people have a B flat trumpet, we're going to start with that, and we might do some C trumpet. I don't have that completely planned out. But, uh, and we're going to just do some lead pipe buzzing, right? Now, uh, the lead pipe sometimes can bring tension into the playing, but that's why we're going to use it because it, again, it's a magnifying glass and we just want to feel that airflow on the low note and the high note and maybe the higher note, right? Which are kind of a low E, E flat, F area, right? So again, same thing, just right? We're blowing and the buzz is happening because we're blowing into the horn first, making the pinwheel spin, right? And then, and then this, the, the, the vibration will come after, right? But we do want to blow a good amount of air, right? Almost immediately, the vibration happens for me. I'm sort of expecting it though. So you might get something like, and that's okay. It's different, right? It's, it's, it's better in some weird way. Uh, and maybe we're not even sure if it's better yet, but we want, so we want to start closer to where the vibration, again, same thing we did before. The lips are starting closer and closer together so that that's not as jarring, but the airflow is never impeded. Now at this point, you might say, well, Gabriel, I feel, in, in, I feel resistance in the air now because the vibration is so violent. Well, okay, yeah, sure. 
see if you can mitigate some of that, right? See if you can make different shapes that seem uh, less resistant without changing the fact that you're, the vibration is happening. You don't want to stop the vibration, right? So just try different shapes. Maybe it's tongue shape, maybe it's jaw shape, maybe it's lift shape. Maybe you need to make it more three-dimensional, like come out this way, or maybe you need to roll in more. Could be anything, right? Just try different things and see what happens. For me, if I'm not in the slot, right, when I'm lower than the slot, uh, the, the brightness of the buzz makes it less resistant and then uh, go, getting back up into the slot really relieves all the tension for me. So that's what you want. And then the high note, this one is where people start to, to clamp down. Don't do it, right? Just think about the speed of the air being faster, but the release being that much more, right? So instead of going, ha, oh, we're going, ha, oh, right? Oh, we're just, everything is smaller, but the release stays the same. And you can approach it the same way, right? I'm, I'm not forming anything. I'm just letting it be all, blah, 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 right? And then I'll form it afterwards, and then I want to, I want to preform, I want to get closer to where it's going to be so that I don't build tension into like catching up, but I already kind of know where it's going to respond, right? And that's how we're doing this. It's like from nothing. And now I know where that kind of is, so I'm going to start closer. And now I know where that is, so I'm going to start even closer. I should feel that support really strongly now. And now I'm just going to make better shapes so that maybe that gets brighter or airier or whatever, but the release, I want the release to be even less resistant. This should be the easiest G on top of the staff, right? That's, there's not a lot of resistance in that. And uh, remember the things that we've already done, right? I, the thing that mattered for me just now was thinking about this window device. I, I brought my corners together better and it made a better nozzle that interfaced better between my lip, my, so the air coming up to the lips and then into the mouthpiece. And because I didn't have my corners good enough at first, uh, my lips were sort of just, they were too flat. They were getting in the way and, uh, and they were vibrating, of course, but I needed to bring these in to make this more three-dimensional. <clears throat> and I can feel that, and I can describe it to you, but you don't have to know all that. You just have to experiment. Remember the things, the, the sensations that you've already built, including that release of air. That's always the most important. Then if we want to try other notes, we can. Uh, I like to connect those two notes together first. And for this, we might drop our jaw, or we might just use our tongue position. Um, whatever works for you, right? It's all about the release of air. If that changes, then don't do that. I like to start on the top note also because that's the harder one for me to get efficient. And then once I got it, I can go down and come back up and I feel like I haven't moved. So just connect those two together through one complete blow. That's the Al Bazzuti saying my dad loves, right? Uh, everything you do is one complete blow of the trumpet. That's what we're working on here, is that we don't want it to be different blows, different amounts of resistance and compression and whatever. We know that things like that are happening, but we want to feel the sensation of sameness in the release of the air uh, over this octave. And that's the, that's the normal register of the trumpet. If we want it the high register, all we want to do is blow harder and through, right? And so again, maintaining that release but also building compression out of the whole system, and we're gonna get a high D. Watch. So that's blowing harder from my support, but nothing else changes, right? I just maintain everything that we've built. Okay, great. So now, uh, we can put this back together now. We've done some lead pipe buzzing. And, oops, just checking my chat. I have a couple people there. Hi, people. 
So we've got, we've got lead pipe buzzing. Now we can do this also through the vented valve. You'll see this in a lot of my videos. Um, you can take your second valve out and put it back in on the bottom. And it's a G, roughly. And you'll notice it's really aggressively loud. That's because I'm really trying to move air. I'm trying to sort of go to the edges of what is possible so that I can feel any tiny little bit of change, any tiny little bit of resistance that I'm adding to the system that I shouldn't, uh, tension, whatever it is, I want to notice it right away and I want to deal with it. And so I won't be able to play very loud if I have a bunch of, if, you know, my lips are fighting to get out, right? No, this is starting from way too open. And we're still starting from a poo as much as we can, but we're basically, our aperture is blown wide open right away, and we want that for now, right? I can bring back control to it later, but I need that airflow. And again, what, what is all this for? A relaxed sound. Well, now we've got it on the actual trumpet, so let's find out about that relaxed sound. I'm going to mute the, the, the vocal mic uh, because now we're playing through the bell and it's quite loud. So I would say this sound doesn't sound relaxed, but it feels really easy to produce. If I back off the air a little bit, right, then I'm not maxing out all of the parameters. Right? I'm not right on the edge, the bleeding edge of what's possible. And then I'm going to get really relaxed, right? Uh, a sound that really just is buttery smooth. Uh, and we'll need to play some valves to notice that smoothness, I think, but we can get the sound right now. So I'll just... I'll blow a little less volume, but I still want that feeling of reflection from the whole horn that I can feel sort of making my lips vibrate, right? That's what we're getting out of the, the lead pipe, the raw lead pipe and the vented valve lead pipe. So again, just a little less amount of air, but just as much sound is what we're looking for. And we should, we should get a little bit of that uh, high, the highs of the sound that are sort of aggressive they'll come out and we'll just get this nice round tone. So now that's, I'm starting to consider that pretty relaxed tone. It's very full, it's still very loud, but it's not aggressively loud and it's not aggressively bright. And so we've taken some of the highs out of it. Uh, a lot of this has to do with mouth shape, but again, if, you're, if your tongue, your jaw is too high, you're gonna feel resistance to the airflow. And so you're not gonna do that if you're really focused on keeping the airflow going. And then the resultant sound has a lot of room to maneuver. And so as you're playing, you just get this beautiful oh with a pretty low tongue position. And that works because we're playing really loud. So we have the, we have the air flow uh, to build up whatever compression we need. And then almost immediately we release that compression into the, into, into the instrument. That's why we don't feel like uh, any note is like a high note or something, right? It's because the, 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 there's a compression balance. We're generating it, but we're also getting rid of it. Into, into vibration, right? So that's what we're gonna do now as we move around the horn, right? So let's go right to that. Uh, I infamously love violin number one because it's what I grew up doing in uh, undergrad. And I think it is a very simple exercise, but we can do anything really. What we want is to maintain the airflow, right? And the Schlossberg book is really a much better source for this in a lot of ways. Um, so we can try it. We'll do Schlossberg number seven, okay? Schlossberg seven. If you wanna, uh, if you don't have it or you, you know, uh, wanna follow along, it's it's very slow. It's half notes. The middle half note has a diminuendo on it, 
and then you go up to the next partial, at least on the first line, okay? So we're just gonna do G, G, C, and we, then there's a fermata on that C, and we wanna fall in love with the way that this soft C, right, because it's diminuendo, it's mezzo forte with a diminuendo to this higher note. That C is gonna be really magically soft. So we're not playing loud the whole time, but we are keeping the airflow going, right? So we're shaping the air, and this is the important part, and this is what I sort of left out yesterday that's really important, your tongue position and your jaw position are shaping the air so that they match where the actual vibration is happening and the horn itself, right? If I blow too big for the horn, I get a lot of resistance. If I blow too small for the horn, I feel the resistance right here. If I blow just right, then I don't feel anything at all. And that's what we're doing here, right? That's this, this relaxed sound concept and the airflow concept, right? So here we go with, bi uh, sorry, not violin, uh, Schlossberg 7. And I just make it smaller and smaller until it cracks up to the next partial without resistance though, without, without adding tension to the air. I'm just making the shape smaller and keeping the air releasing. And then all of a sudden it cracks and I'm like, oh, I guess I get that note. Great. Next one, F sharp. And just keep that air flowing, right? On long tones that we might do, uh, you're, you're learning how to exponentially support over the course of your breath so that the airflow stays the same. That's also really important. That's similar here. Once we get to the last note, we have to support more and more and more. Otherwise, the note starts to die on us and uh, our lips will start to do work to try to keep it. And that's, that's resisting the air in a different way, right? That's clamping down on it. And we, we, we aren't doing long tones right now because we have a, a, a different... We're, we're looking at the air flow rather than the air amount, but they're really one and the same. It's hard for me to keep it stable near the end of the breath. So you do all of these. You can also do the ones that go looking for is if something changes here it's gonna it, it, as you go upwards you might want to close your aperture uh, like forcibly in order to generate this compression that's going to change the way the air flows past the lips so that's not the way to do it it's all tongue position it's ta ta whatever you want to do vowel sound wise right and if you just sing it your tongue will do the stuff I can feel my tongue. You can even see my finger getting moved by it, right? I'm just touching the middle of my tongue and singing. That's what we need it to do. And I tend to do dorsal tonguing, so I keep my tongue uh, anchor, anchor tongue position, and that makes it even more sort of dramatic when I do this. It comes really far forward because it's, well, because it's stuck in the in the in the front there, but you don't have to do that. Just sing it. However you sing it, that's a good way to play it, and it'll keep your tone really relaxed, uh, your production really relaxed this way, right? Just don't let your lips do it. That's the big thing. Okay, so now we'll do violin, and now we're moving up and down. So what does that mean? Well, there's there's a trick here that we have to know about, and that is uh, on the way up, I just need to keep my lips relaxed, right? Keep them in the same position maybe keep my corners 
uh, solid so that I don't lose control here, but that's really going to be important as I go downward. If I, if I relax more as I go downward, well, it's possible, right? But I lose control completely. And uh, I get a different sort of result of not keeping the airflow the same. I start to lose air too fast where it's like, and I, it's not useful at all. Plus, I, it sounds bad. I, I would never settle for that, right? So instead, I want to really focus on, on these, these, these corners, right? As I go downward, I'm maintaining my aperture, and that's going to maintain the airflow, right? So this is a little bit like what we talked about yesterday. So this is the same exercise, and you can do lower and louder in the Schlossberg book. That's kind of the same as, it's the opposite exercise as higher and softer, right? But it does the same kind of motion. It'll teach you to keep those corners firm enough because you're playing louder, and so the, the higher volume is going to require slightly firmer embouchure anyway, right? Uh, so I would highly recommend that. Always, always, always focusing on the airflow, right? That the air is never restricted, uh, and that the lips are hopefully staying in the same place, but they're never tightening up, um, only firming up in this one very specific way we just talked about. Um, then you have ones that do the opposite, right? So here's another one that we can do. We can do higher and louder, right? Um, and lower and softer. So what does that require? Well, we, we only need to know one more trick here, and that is as we go up, we're not moving anything. We're just adding air. And because of the faster air, or sorry, because of the more air, the air uh, in the same shape, right, it's going to go faster. Uh, if you think about like uh, uh, rapids, like, a, like how, how a flood happens, right, more and more and more water goes into the same area. And so it has to speed up or it overflows, right? So we're in the speeding up. We're adding air as we go up. And of course, that's also going to be more volume. And so we're opening up the aperture, but only by virtue of that more air. So I'm not even aware. I don't want to feel like, oh, it's blowing open. I want to feel like it's staying the same because I'm feeding it more air. Does that make sense? I know that's a little bit counterintuitive to what I just said, but they're both true, trust me. Uh, so I'm, I'm allowing for that extra volume to open up the aperture and make a louder sound and also a higher, uh, a higher note because the shape is not changing. And then on the way down, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm also not changing the shape, but now I have to maintain my corners because as I drop down partials, uh, my lips are going to want to kick. They're going to want to stay in the higher energy slot, and so they don't like sort of downshifting in this way. And so I have to just make sure that they're, they just maintain position as I go down. And, and just I'm, I'm not intentionally taking away air, but I'm not supporting exponentially in the same way. I'm, again, I'm focused on just keeping the air moving and so a lot of times when I'm going down, I do think about blowing a little harder just to keep the airflow going. But if I'm getting softer, I'm also going to allow for that air to sort of dissipate a little bit, right? So I'm most, mostly concerned about the up and louder. The other part, I'll, I can figure that out later. just up and down, and I'm focused on the airflow, right? Uh, I'm still doing some tongue position motions, right? I'm still going ta, so I am changing the shape a little bit, but that's because I, if I'm going to get louder, I have to overcome the, the wider aperture and the higher note together, right? Those are counterintuitive, so 
I'm using the, the tongue position to really lock into the slots of the lip slur, but I'm also increasing the air. And so those two together, it's just coordination, right? Uh, and the Schlossberg look is really the best place to build all this. You've got uh, more air is one component. Uh, higher and lower tongue position is another component. And holding, right, keeping things from falling apart is a third component. And then a bunch of the exercises will combine two or all three of those. And so really, the Schlossberg book is great because, first of all, everybody sounds terrible doing the Schlossberg book, right? It's, it's really delicate, tricky stuff. But you're supposed to sound bad and then improve it, right? It's not supposed to just be, oh, this is easy. And if it is, then this, none of this is for you. Uh, it's, you know, go, go play the, the, I don't know, uh, Peter Maxwell Davies concerto. Good for you, right? But, um, but yeah, just, you're supposed to just try to make it sound really nice and also try to make it feel really easy. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not doing any work. It means that you know that it's going to happen for you, right? You know that it's going to work when you go for it. That's my definition in this case of what feels easy, right? So it may not be easy down here. It may not be easy here, but it feels like the airflow just never stops, never ceases, and you've got this big, fat, relaxed tone the whole time, right? That feels easy to me. And if we can maintain that, then trumpet playing can kind of feel easy a lot of the time. Now, if you get into really tricky things, you won't be able to do them, and that's what yesterday's practice was all about. But today's practice is just about basic tone production, making sure that that stays. All right, so now what do we have to do? Well, we've done slow slurs. Guess what? It's time for fast slurs. And uh, we can do, we're going to do what I call proto vince slurs today, which is just the lower octave um, and faster and faster and faster. And again, that airflow is the, is the critical component. I can do anything I want as long as that airflow is unaffected, right? So I'm going to play three notes now, fast, but starting off slow. So it's just double, double, double. I'll do it one more time. Uh, I'll, I'll just keep going, but on the next one. So we, we do, if you think about it as quarters, we quarter, 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 eighth, 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 eighth. That's two of those, right? Uh, 16th, 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 and then 30 seconds. I, I, that sounds dumb when I sing it, but but so you, you, do, you do one too many eighth notes just to make it all make sense kind of in a 4-4 four, four framework, right? You can do a lip bend at the end if you want, just to make sure that air is really moving. All right. I like to do scales, as you know, at the end of my lip slurs. We're going to do some high, high range next, so I'm sort of already gearing up for like lip trills, right? And when I restart these, I should explain, when I restart this, uh, it's because I feel too much restriction in the aperture. I feel like I'm going, eh, instead of ha, really nice, big, open, again, airflow, right? Relaxed sound. point. A flat is, is my nemesis. That's when, when I start to play trumpet differently when I don't want to. That time, the whole time through, I had too relaxed of a setup, right? I was way too flabby, and therefore I kept getting da-da-da, uh, right? The low A flats all sucked. 
And then the last ones, I firmed up this bottom lip a little bit and got them because my, I wasn't paying attention to my corners. And so my, my tone wasn't expansive. It wasn't relaxed. It was getting like too much lip, too much flappy kind of relaxed lip. So just because we're saying relaxed sound doesn't necessarily mean completely relaxed face, right? We started there, but then we found out what parts needed to be firm so that we could ensure the relaxed nature of the release of the air, right? So don't confuse the two. It's the air we care about, not the face. The face is gonna do what it needs to do to keep the air working for us. All right, two more. So now we also neglected at the very beginning I just realized to talk about turnaround at all, and that is because we did it sort of inherently, right? We went, but if you have a hitch in your giddy up, as I like to say, if you have, a, if you hold your breath before you go, you're going to have tension right here, all in your upper chest and in your throat. And you might even have tension in your lips as well, right? So that should be, if you've been having trouble this whole time working the tension out, go address that. See if the, uh, see if the reflection uh, sorry, see if the turnaround is maybe part of what's causing the, the, the resistance of the air and see if you can work that out. Go back, always go back, go back to the most simple step that you can think that you'll d definitely do well, right? So if you have to go all the way back to just going, right, that's the first thing we did. Well, then start there and then build that into, and then build that into, and then build that into airy, airy buzzing, and then you're on your way, right? And just make sure that that stays every step of the way. A lot of times when we get the trumpet in our hands, we start to go, and well, it's not gonna work, right? Okay, so now we've done fast lawyers. Guess what? It's time for high range. Now, there's one additional thing we need to learn about high range that we've already actually learned. Uh, so it's not additional, but it's really critical. And that is, as I go for the high register, right? I'm gonna to need to blow really hard in order to get really fast speeds of air. So I wanna stay as open as I can so I have as much space initially, right? So that I can constrict that space as I go up to match the, the size of the, uh, to match the, the size of the vibration, right? So that I'm not, I don't wanna be going like that with my embouchure and I'm actually playing super high, right? So I wanna start with on the top of the staff, right? really big and open so that I have room for my tongue position to keep matching the airspeed necessary, right? And then I'm also gonna add air, just like we did when we were doing the, my sort of made up higher and louder Schlossbergs. We're gonna add air and control it with the tongue, and that's what's gonna get us the extreme high register. So basically, if you think about it, I'm just, I'm creating a shape, right? And let's say this is the shape that works really well, okay? So that's my right? And then I'm gonna take the shape and I'm gonna go, right? I'm gonna blow harder through the shape. And because I don't let the shape change, this requires some strength, right? Because I don't let the shape change, the air absolutely has to get faster. And then I can also change the shape very slightly as well so that I'm controlling that, I'm making sure that it's always fast enough to crack to the next partial. And I want those things in combination, but mostly it's find the shape that works and then blow hard past it, right, through the horn, and the, the, the release of the air should not get, got, not get tighter and tighter. If it does, I need to adjust for that. I need to release it better, and that's, that's what's really tricky about the extreme high register is that sometimes when you're playing a really high note, you're actually trying to keep your lips open in order to keep the, the note from getting squeezy, right? And this took me a ton of time to figure out, uh, and I still, I still don't do it all the time. But don't worry about that for now. Just worry about finding a shape that works for the lip trail at the top of the staff 
and then blowing through that shape without letting it change. That's the hard part is not letting, not, don't let your lips kind of crunch down on the airstream. And also uh, don't let them get blown out by the extreme interaural pressures that you're generating with all this air that you're gonna blow from down here, okay? So good old, our favorite high range exercise. And always starting, by the way, with that same release of air. And I'm gonna mute this because it'll get loud. So there was the shape in the middle, right? I, I stop, make sure that's the shape, and then I put more and more air through the shape, and it gets louder and brighter as I go higher, but it stays, it sta the, the, the air release stays the same, and that's, that's, gonna, that's gonna be sustainable over the whole gig, so to speak, right? If I'm playing lead, I gotta play a lot of high notes. I don't want each one of them to feel like I'm you know, trying to lift a, a car with my neck, right? That's awful. So, <clears throat> a couple more of these. Always rest a little bit in between. <clears throat> Don't just go for it over and over again. You'll hurt yourself. So I almost always go up to double high A there uh, and make sure that that's really solid. You can tell that there's enormous amounts of air pressure that I'm generating, right? And you know, my face turns red and everything. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, <clears throat> like I said, interaural pressures, right, in your oral cavity. Uh, but I'm releasing that usefully and that's why the notes keep coming out. If I, I, I'm not sure if I can get B flat, but you can see when I stop doing this, then, uh, and it's usually about B flat or B, uh, if I have to, I can build up to double high C, but I generally don't have to play that note a lot. So um, I'd rather play one more Harris etude or something with my chops today. But uh, you can see, and let me, let me do it until it quits. And then you'll see where that spot is where I'm, I'm resisting at the aperture and the air is not flowing the same. And so it's not working for me anymore. And that's when I get in trouble. I knew it would be B flat. You can hear it. My bottom lip was, was still open, but my top lip, uh, they were getting kind of dragged. And so my top lip and my bottom lip couldn't both keep responding. Uh, they got pulled too far apart away, uh, away from each other, right? And so I kind of got the P, a piece of the B flat, but I was crushing my lip and then trying to pull it and you know it just wasn't gonna work. So I'd have to work on that. I, what I would do is I would go back to the A flat and the A and I would do those more so that I built up an endurance for the thing that I'm trying to do that's slightly higher. And I feel like, yeah, all it, it's just a half step, right? I mean, it might take me a, a week to get the B flat, but it would be really solid if I did a lot of A's and A flats, um, basically until I can't, until that starts to happen on the A flat and the A, right? And then and I'm just gonna kind of work my way down again then. And then when I'm fresh, I hopefully can get that B flat and then eventually the B the same way and so on. So anyway, that's 
that's our our relaxed sound, right? Um, that's our that's our. It it has a nice uh, well ring to it, right? A nice sound, like a quality to it, but also it's very easy to produce. And so we can put it to work here. Uh, I can I have the Hindemith. Uh, I have uh, Brant number eight. I'm gonna play Hindemith. I think that's a good place for sounds uh, that sound good, right? Nobody wants to sound bad on the Hindemith, surely. Um, and we only play B flat trumpet, but that's fine. That's actually hard. The, the longer the horn, the harder it is, I think, to get this to happen. So the shorter the horn, the, the less innate resistance the pipes have because they're shorter, right? Now, you might not agree with me on that, but you don't have to. It's true. Uh, the, the piccolo trumpet for a lot of people is the most resistant, but that's because it's much smaller and the mouthpiece is generally smaller. Uh, but you'll probably find that the shorter the horn, the less overall resistance to the air, at least, that the horn has. And you can for sure feel it if you play like an E flat trumpet and a bass trumpet right next to each other. The bass trumpet has, you have to, you have to hold and blow uh, so much further and uh, you really got to focus on staying relaxed because there's a lot to, to do there. Whereas the E flat trumpet, as soon as you blow through it, it's almost in the room again, right? It's very short. So anyway, let's play some Hindemith. And again, we're going to try to maintain now this really big, beautiful sound. So I'm going to start with the production we've built today, but I'm going to add back some of the stuff we worked on yesterday through those corners, right? I want to keep things working the same, but I, I'm starting with this more relaxed approach, right? And Hindemith is perfect for this because it moves around a lot, uh, up and down and sort of in some odd intervals, but it also has pretty slow moving notes most of the time, at least at the beginning here. And, uh, and it has almost every kind of volume that you'd ever want. So you can practice this way. And if you don't know the Hindemith, it's a great time to learn it. So you could hear in the softs, my tone got a little bit covered up. And that's because I wasn't ready to play softly with this relaxed approach. And, and that is, that's one of the pitfalls here is it's really hard to relax into soft. You can do it and you should practice it, but uh, I prefer to sort of set up into soft the same way that I would set up into loud. And that's gonna require more uh, physical sort of activity than this approach requires. But uh, okay, so to, to recap a little bit, why, how is this the same thing as what I do recommend uh, people do, which is this sort of hard line, really hard reflection based thing? Well, if you're too tight to begin with, you'll never find the reflection. Um, you're going to always have too much lip in the mouthpiece and too not, not constructively so. So you're going to have like sort of a brittle and um, incomplete tone, I would say. Right. And you're going to find resistance, uh, even though you may be very flexible and very facile. Right, because you're able to manipulate things really easily, but you never get that expansive tone. So erase it. Right, forget what the mouthpiece is, or forget what your embouchure is supposed. Forget what your embouchure is supposed to feel like. Right, make it like that instead. All right, build it this way, and try to maintain this beautiful expand. You'll be surprised how easy it is to produce a beautiful tone on the trumpet that you're really happy with. Right, and you'll say, oh, of course, like. Why don't I do it this way the whole time? Well, because most pieces that we play are too hard to maintain just the most relaxed all the time. And so then we end up having tension here and uh, too relaxed here and too tight here. And, and that, that doesn't seem to work. But 
you got to start from this position. You got to start from can I pr produce the tone in an easy way in this in a in a relaxed way like this, right? Can I can I maintain the the airflow over different notes and different dynamics? Uh, can I use just the air? Can I use just the tongue position, right? And and match whatever notes I'm playing so that it, I don't feel any resistance to the air to the air release, right? That's what you want to focus on is air release. And if you can do that, then I'm, I'm going to be able to get this right now. Uh, yeah, I just had to match my tongue position to the amount of air that I was going to be allowed to use for piano. And now, the double tonguing sort of screws it up still, so I would, I would beef up my embouchure for this. But flow really works well for the Hindemith, right? And I'm, I always want to maintain flow, even if I have a beefier embouchure, even if I'm really holding hard uh, just to keep things in working order. The flow is what I'm keeping in order, right? So it's really not different, and that's what I wanted to sort of prove. It's not different than what we did yesterday, but if you start from our like hard and tight embouchure that doesn't, that's like an immovable object, you're going to have a bad time just trying to get tone to come out, right? If you start from this place, you'll you'll feel like you have to do too much work, too much changing work over time. But then you add back, like keep it firm, and in this place where the air flows really freely, and uh, then you understand how to build compression and release it at the same time, right? So I'll play I'll play a little more of this, just because uh, it's a nice piece, and I'll try to just play my best. I'm not going to try to do one thing or another. I needed this warm up today, and that's why we did it. But it's also, like I said, a response to yesterday's warm up. And there's one student in, in particular that I have in mind in my studio right now that I think would really benefit from today's warm up as a precursor to anything else um, that uh, he might want to do. So. So there you go. That's that's the part of the Hindemith that most people play for juries, and it's the part where most people fold. And there's, I mean, there's a there's a half a movement left still, uh, but you need you don't need to just hear me play Hindemith all day. Uh, I think the proof is in the pudding, right? That keeping relaxed, but also getting a firm enough embouchure to keep it working, uh, that's the combination that you want, and that's where your endurance comes from, while uh, staying facile and able to move around the horn and having a good sound, right? All of these things can cost endurance, but if you use them together properly, then you're using your strength to maintain your positioning, and then you feel like you can play forever. And it does take more work. It takes more effort than just ugh, staying totally relaxed. But if we start there and then we build in just exactly what kind of holding we need, then uh, I think that's a good starting place for most people. And then as you become more familiar with that, you can start 
in a better place and not build it completely from scratch every day because you kind of already know where it needs to be. All right, that's it for me today. Thank you so much for listening and uh, for watching. I hope this helps. And uh, until next time, take it easy.